headlines from the war in Ukraine. They mentioned various countries, Russia, the European Union, the countries of Eastern Europe, Syria, and even China. These events have stirred interest in end times prophecy and the final days of the earth. We just weren't talking about this before, but to see these nations that we will see in prophecy coming up is startling. And that's what has motivated many people to begin taking another look. What does God's word say about the future? We're going to look at biblical prophecy, as Dick said, uh, this year. Scripture predicts the future from the rapture of the church to events in heaven, from the tribulation to the Lord's glorious return, and from the millennium or thousand-year reign of Christ to the new heaven and the new earth. A lot of very fascinating and interesting things that are made clear in the Word of God. Today, we're going to look at several of them, the rapture of the church and the related events in heaven, and just a peek at the tribulation, just a little bit of the first part of the tribulation. Uh, we're going to look at various scriptures in both the Old and New Testament. So if you didn't quite get it, remember the reference, and you can always check it out a little bit later. Let's start by reading a portion in Matthew 24. Matthew 24. We're going to read the first 14 verses. Just some context. Matthew 24 and 25 is what's called the Olivet Discourse and is very prophetic in nature and aimed at the Jewish people themselves. So we're just going to look a little bit at the first part of it. That's Matthew chapter 24, reading from the New King James. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world uh, as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. For some background on biblical prophecy, to correctly interpret biblical prophecy, we need to understand that there are two distinct groups that are spoken of. One is Israel, and the other is the church of believers. The church is a mystery, and it was not revealed in the Old Testament. There are no references that we can point to it there. No mention was made in Scripture until the New Testament that God would form Jew and Gentile into one body through salvation called the church. It was in the New Testament that the Lord Jesus Christ made a prophecy about the coming church in the Gospels. He said in Matthew 16, 18, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church 
and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. First mention of the church, which is so much of us today, namely Gentiles, some Messianic Jewish believers. One other thing, just as a background for prophecy, God's program for the church not only includes what, going on, what goes on today, but also prophetically, it talks about the church's rapture. It talks about the church in heaven. The church will not go through this troublous time called the tribulation. And I say that for two reasons. First, the promise the Lord addressed to the faithful church of Philadelphia. Revelation 3.10, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. And the second prophecy related item having to do with the rapture is what happens at the very beginning of the time that John spends in heaven. The timing of John's rapture-like invitation to come up to heaven. Revelation 4.1 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open to heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you the things which must take place after this. So the church is not in the tribulation, but prophecy is prophecy of the tribulation applying to Israel. For Israel, God's program for Israel and Jerusalem is mentioned in Daniel 9. Anybody who looks at prophecy always takes a look at that. The tribulation, this troublous time, is called the, the time of Jacob's trouble. Again, the inferences to the Jewish folks. Jacob's trouble, and that's going to last, according to Daniel 9, seven years puts it in weeks, but they're really items that can be described to years. Seven weeks of years out of the total prophecy of 490 years. Daniel 9, 24 says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Prophecy the Lord gave to Daniel to give to his people. All of this was to take place. What he didn't see is the church. But in fact, as Christ came, Christ in fact accomplished finishing the transgression, for instance. Okay, let's take a look at each of the items that I mentioned. First of all, the rapture. Here's a key verse. 1 Thessalonians 4.15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. The coming of the Lord. Now, this is not talking about when the Lord comes back in power and glory. That will take place at the end of that troublous time called the tribulation. The Lord Jesus promised to return for us as Christians. Those who've passed away, gone to be with the Lord. And second, those who are alive at the time who named the name of Christ. The Lord Jesus said, according to John 14, 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. His return, that rapture as we call it, that time that he comes to meet us in the air, his return will happen in an instant, maybe more than an instant. In a moment, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that's not the blink of an eye, the twinkling, just the sparkle in the eye, that fast. Interesting. When this happens, and if we are alive, or even if we have passed away, there will be three sounds that will announce the Lord's return. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. 
That's not just window dressing. All of it has meaning. A shout of command with a shout, just like Christ did at the tomb of Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. A command, a shout. Number two, a voice, a voice of victory, perhaps from the angels because of the mention of the voice of an archangel. And number three, the sound of a trumpet. Well, that might not mean too much to us today, other than maybe we like trumpet music in a band. Trumpet, for the time of the people of Israel, among other things, was a call for a special event. It was also a time to gather because we're about to be on the move. Those two things are mentioned right there in the sound of a trumpet. The time of Christ coming for his own has been called the rapture, as I said. First Thessalonians 4.17 uses the phrase caught up, caught up. That means to seize, to carry off, to take quickly. The Latin word for caught up is rapto, R-A-P-T-O, from which we get the word rapture. So through the ages, various believers have called it the rapture, the catching up, the seizing up. The Lord Jesus Christ at that time will unite us with Christian friends and family because the dead in Christ will rise first. All the wonderful people that you've known who've gone to be with the Lord, they're Christians. They'll rise first. Then we which are alive and remain will meet them in the air. But here's what's interesting. 17, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, again, the first part of it says, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, get this, together with them. Together with them, those who've already passed on to be with the Lord, they are going to be there. And what this reminds you of is just one story in the Gospels. Remember when Jesus saw the widow's son carried out on a beer, on a uh, tablet, if you will, where he was dead. He was really heading for the funeral. And the Lord raised him. And he, the scripture says, tenderly delivered him to his mother. That's what the Lord does. And that's what he will do at the time of the rapture. This massive number of people from all the Christian ages who knew the Lord are going to be together. But the Lord will be sure you get to see the right people, see all of the people that are there. One other interesting point here. The phrase in the second part of 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says, to meet the Lord in the air. So, well, that word meet, translated, the Greek word translated meet, carries the idea of meeting a royal or important person. You're going to meet the Lord in the air. You're going to meet that royal king of kings in the air. Those resurrected will go from a natural body to a spiritual body. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 44, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. We shall be changed. What's been put in the ground, our flesh, is going to be changed. But there's more. Christians will receive a body like the Lord's glorified body. You remember when he walked this earth after the resurrection? He still ate, but he could pass through walls. He could do things like that. It was a different body. Philippians 3.21 says, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Conformed. 1 Corinthians 15.49 says, and as we have borne the image of the man of dust, and we have, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. A lot is going to happen during that time. 
the rapture. Wait for the sounds. Get to see so many loved ones who died in Christ, friends who just live in a different part of the world. You'll see them all. And the Lord will make sure he gets to introduce everyone to everyone. And we will have a body like Christ's body and bear the image of the heavenly man. Pretty super. So now we're in heaven. For we are. We've left this earth. We're in heaven. So now there are some things that happen, two major events that happen while we're in heaven. You're we talking tribulation? No, no, no. Tribulation, back down there. You're not back down there anymore. Key verse, 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Scripture says the judgment seat of Christ will occur after the rapture. We're all gathered in heaven. We have glorified bodies. The Lord is speaking in Luke 14, 14, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Amen. This will take place in heaven, and Jesus Christ will be the judge. The term judgment seat of Christ is from the Greek word bima, B-E-M-A, which was a platform in Greek towns where orations were made, where decisions were handed down, official decisions, and awards given out, like in the Olympics. The words, the word particularly in 2 Corinthians 5.10 is appear. You mean I'm just sort of going to walk in? It means to make manifest, to reveal. Meaning we are there to have our works reviewed. Oh, I didn't bargain for that. But that's what's going to happen. Our works will be reviewed. The word good implies works done for God's glory. The word bad means worthless or useless. This will be a time of reflection of how you serve the Lord during your life. The basis of examination is not salvation and not the sins you committed during this life of yours after becoming a Christian. We have all been delivered for condemn from condemnation. Hebrews 10, 17 says, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So why am I there? To think about what you did during this life. Just chatting with some people during the, the break, we talked about perseverance. Well, that's what we're doing. What are we doing in our service for the Lord? Character and motives will be possible. Picture yourself in a situation where it's too late to do anything else for the Lord. You're done. That person you really wanted to talk to about the Lord, you can't. That service that you wanted to do for your King of Kings, never got around to. It's done. It's over. Character and motives of our service will lead to either reward or correction. You mean I could be thrown out of heaven? No. It is not salvation-based. This is a review. Some of us have bosses that review us once a year. And they sit down. My mind would always go looking at the list. And anything that was negative, those are the ones that bothered me the most. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 to 15 says, Now if anyone builds on this foundation, which is Christ, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, 
he will receive a reward. She will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss or she will suffer loss. But he himself or she will be saved, yet though is through fire. It's hard to wrap your mind around what's going on. Such joy. You've seen so many wonderful things. It's all true. You're there. The excitement, the joy, and all of heaven to come. Harry Ironside, a preacher in his book on First and Second Corinthians, did an imagination of what it would be like. What would God say? What would happen at that particular time? This helped me understand it a little bit better. The Lord speaking in this imaginary example. You had a wonderful opportunity to glorify me, but you failed because you were so self-occupied. You were so much concerned about what people would think of you instead of being concerned about pleasing me. I will have to blot all that out. I cannot reward you for that. For there was too much self in that service. And then he will point to something else, maybe something you had forgotten altogether. And he will say, there, you thought you failed in that, didn't you? You really thought you blundered so dreadfully that your whole testimony amounted to nothing. But I was listening and observing. And I knew that the, that hour of weakness, that in that hour of weakness, your one desire was to glorify me. And though nobody applauded you, I took note of it and will reward you for it. Get the feeling of what's going on. It is not a judge condemning. It is a parent lovingly recognizing and correcting what's been done. Now the important or most important point in the judgment seat of Christ. Note Paul's behavior as he anticipated the judgment seat of Christ. Paul, he shouldn't have to worry at all. What does Paul say? 1 Corinthians 9.27, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have re preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Wow. Commentator John Corson writes, every day I live, I build upon the foundational principle that Jesus is the Christ, that he is my Lord. The question is, do I build with gold, silver, and precious stones, or with wood, stubble, and hay? What is the telling difference between their, these materials? Gold, silver, and precious stones don't burn. That's Paul's plan to be ready. Okay, second event in heaven, marriage. Everybody likes to go to a wedding. This happens to be your wedding, you as a believer. It is the marriage of the lamb. See, we focus on the bride today, but we have to understand that the bridegroom is very important here, the most important, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's our verse, Revelation 21.9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. The marriage ceremony occurs in heaven after both the rapture and the Bema seat, judgment seat of Christ, but before the Lord's return before he gets back into this world, which is going through tribulation right now. God's people are seen as the betrothed bride or wife in both the Old and New Testaments. This is really interesting. The intimacy that God wants. Adam and Eve in the garden. God walked in the garden because he wanted to spend time with Adam and Eve. Hosea 2, 19 to 20 says, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. 
in Ephesians 23, 30, and 23 and 32. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. He is the savior of the body. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The desire for that marriage relationship. Christ as the bridegroom takes the church as his bride so that the relationship that was pledged earlier might be consummated and that the two would become one. Revelation 19.7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. We'll be at that wedding. We'll be there. Now, a bride in Jewish culture would prepare herself for the wedding by bathing, rubbing on oil, and using perfume. Her hair would be specially fixed for the occasion, and she would wear a beautiful gown in the Jewish culture of that day. The church as the bride of the lamb will wear a garment of precious fine linen, which speaks of her faithful obedience and good works done through Christ. Remember, the church individuals have already been through the review process and they have already been rewarded for their good deeds and it will be reflected in the garments that they wear. Revelation 19.8 says, and to her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousness, righteous acts of the saints, the righteous acts of the saints. The marriage ceremony will only include the Lord Jesus and his church, those believers who come to know him. Well, what about the reception? Well, that's called the marriage supper of the Lamb, and that's going to take place afterwards, after Christ's return back on earth with other guests there, where the bride and bridegroom will be introduced. Okay. The last item was the tribulation. I said we would just sort of put our toe in the water. We just get a, an idea of what it's going to be. Next time, we'll talk more about the first and second parts of the tribulation. Why is there a tribulation? Why is the earth going to be beat up? Why are people going to suffer so? Well, the tribulation will not begin until after the rapture. So while things are going on in heaven with us, those items that I mentioned, the tribulation will begin. And the purpose of the tribulation is twofold. First, to test those on the earth. Revelation 3.10 says, I will keep you from the hour of trial which will, shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Testing is the first criteria. Second, to prepare for the arrival of the king. For at the end of the tribulation, the Lord Jesus Christ will burst upon the scene. Malachi 4, 5, and 6 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Yes, people will recognize what they need to do. Most will not. The tribulation is a seven-year period. I mentioned that. It is divided into two. Three and a half, three and a half. There are important events that occur in the first half, the middle, and then the last half called the Great Tribulation. The scripture describes the tribulation as a woman in childbirth. First Thessalonians 5, 3 says, For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Everybody will be in trouble. Now, Matthew describes the events of the tribulation for the first three and a half years. What you will see is there are, if you're going to divide the first and second half, the first half has more natural disasters. And I don't just mean a hurricane or a storm, but things that we're pretty familiar with now, wars, 
famines, things of that nature. The second half has supernatural judgments from God. And you see that in great detail with the trumpet judgments and with the bowl or vial judgments. Again, second part. Now, Matthew gives us events uh, that will occur in that first half of the tribulation. Matthew 24, 4 and 5 says, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. The first thing that's going to go on is deception. You think people are confused now. There will be a great deal of deception. It will be both spiritual and political. John mentions one deceiver, and that's what we've come to know as the Antichrist. He's called the rider on the white horse mentioned in Revelation 6, 1 and 2. He's a final world dictator. He will be someone who everybody will turn to because he has all the answers. We need help. He's going to be the one we'll turn to. He will begin his career as a peacemaker. If you need someone to solve this problem, call on him. But then, after an initial time of peacemaker, he reveals himself during the second half of the, half of the tribulation. What will he do as a peacemaker? What's the big problem in this world? Well, there are a lot. But the Arab-Israeli situation. This man will sign a covenant with Israel to protect her from her enemies. Much like we have NATO supposedly protecting these countries who are under the umbrella of that power. So he'll sign a covenant with Israel. Israel will welcome this man as a great benefactor. Now, the things will be going on, but they will be deceived big time. John 5, 43, the Lord talking. And he says, I have come in my father's name. And he's talking to the Jewish people. And you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. The first notice of the first part of the tribulation is deception. Second is wars. Well, we have a lot of wars going on today, a big war in Europe. Matthew 24, 6 says, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Everybody's going to be fighting everybody else. The one who's the peacemaker, supposedly, called we have called the Antichrist, in fact, will seem like he's above it all, but he will be very shrewd. Next, famine. So deception, wars, and now famine. For nation will rise against nation, Matthew 24, 7, and kingdom against kingdom. Well, war and famine usually go together. Revelation 6.6 6 says terribly high prices for staple foods will occur during this time. And this will just provoke famine because people can't afford to buy the food. Next, death. Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Again, not yet, and this is just the beginning. Earthquakes help to create famines and both help to cause epidemics that take many lives. Who would have imagined what COVID-19 would do to the world? To see something like this, it's coming in the tribulation. Things are getting worse. We're being deceived. We're fighting one another. There's famine, epidemics, death. But more, it'll also be characterized by martyrs, Matthew 24, 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Christians have always been hated by the world. 
but here we have an acceleration of persecution and murders by all nations. You as believers, or believers I should say at that time, will be like an endangered species. Everyone will hate them. There's more. During that time, there will be worldwide chaos. What does that mean? Matthew 24, 10 to 13. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Everybody will hate everybody else. There will be anger, betrayal. And the faithful ones will suffer during this time as martyrs. But here's the key, the last one, Matthew 24, 14, the last verse we read when we started. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. So this is going to be carried on not only in the first part, but through all of the tribulation. Revelation 7, 1 to 8 teaches that God will choose and seal 144,000 Jewish evangelists who will carry the kingdom message to the end of the earth. Can you imagine? Dedicated people looking for every opportunity, traveling anywhere to get the truth out, Jewish evangelists, and God will protect them. God will keep them going. So what do we have here? A time for the church, a time for Israel and the world the rapture, and then the judgment seat of Christ, and then the marriage, and finally, the beginning of the end, the tribulation. So what takeaways can we have from this? It's all prophecy, right? It's not a, that important today. I mean, give me another portion of scripture, can you? No, I think this will do the job. There are seven takeaways. Seven takeaways. Number one, look forward to seeing your born-again loved ones and friends at the rapture. Look forward to seeing your loved ones and friends at the rapture. There's some dear people, people I knew from this assembly so many years ago. They've been with the Lord many years. I'm going to see them again. Loved ones, people that you really loved, your parents, for instance, You'll see them again. So the first takeaway is look forward to seeing your born-again loved ones and friends at the rapture. You've heard the expression, so heavenly-minded, no earthly good. Take a little time to be heavenly-minded. It'll do you good. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, or concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. What a super thing to look forward to. Even as we talk at a funeral, we mention that we as Christians have hope. That's the difference. Number two, Second takeaway, anticipate the amazing things that God has planned for you. Anticipate the amazing things the Lord has planned for you. 1 Corinthians 2.9, but as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. The rapture is just the beginning. All of these things are God's blessing for us. He's prepared them for us. Like you prepare for company coming to your house. Everything has to look good, be right. And you want to do the things they would like to do. Anticipate the amazing things the Lord has planned for you. Okay, number three. Discipline yourself with the Spirit's help to be ready for the judgment seat of Christ. Discipline yourself with the Spirit's help to be ready for the judgment seat of Christ. Again, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. 
you got to work at it. You go and you apply for a job, you get the job you've always wanted, and you're just thrilled. And you're thinking, now, what can I do? I'm ready to go to work. And they say, listen, you can just stay home. We'll send you the checks. Wait a minute. I, I took this job because I really want to do the work. Don't worry about it. You'll be fine. I'll send you the money. It's insane. We can't even imagine that. But we do that sometimes in our Christianity. I'm saved. I can just put it on cruise control and go straight into glory. Discipline yourself with the Spirit's help to be ready for the judgment seat of Christ. Are you going to be beat up, condemned there? No. You're going to have a loving Father talk to you about what's gone on. Think about it now, what you can do. There'll be things that you'll be surprised at and things maybe you struggled with, but you push through and you serve the Lord. Okay, number four, open your heart to love the Lord Jesus Christ more deeply. Open your heart to love the Lord Jesus Christ more deeply. I like this. Peter's writing, 1 Peter 1.8, Whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. You can't see him. You can't right now. One day you will. What a fabulous time. Several of the, the hymns we sang here as well as in the Lord's Supper, we're talking about the future, seeing the Lord face to face. Number five, obey his commands and accept his decisions. Obey his commands and accept his decisions. Ephesians 5.24 says, Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. The church is subject to Christ. Obey him. The answer is yes, sir. That's what you do. It's not, well, you know, Lord, I had other thoughts. and Let's not even talk about it. I, I have a life, you know. Obey his commands and accept his decisions. Number six, be fully committed to your Lord. Be fully committed to him. Love him only. Matthew 23, 37, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Just think about that this week. What does that mean? All my heart, all my soul, all my mind. Be fully committed to your Lord. All of this stuff is coming. As they say in the movies, coming soon to a theater near you. It's coming to your life near you. And the last takeaway, show your concern for those who don't know the Lord and are at risk. Show your concern for those who don't know the Lord and are at risk. Sometimes we're just so busy in life. Someone else will tell them. They'll get by. They'll be fine. You wouldn't want them to start going through the tribulation. We just talked about some of the natural disasters that are going to happen. It gets worse, a lot worse. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, and 3, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Wow. That loved one, that friend, that business associate, they shall not escape. That's why the Lord has given us his spirit, the Holy Spirit, to speak to hearts, to more than back you up. So this is the first part of prophecy. We'll talk more about the tribulation next time we get together. It's interesting reading, but very, very important truth for us. Why don't we close our time in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word. 
We thank you for what it tells us. We're amazed that you want to tell us so much about what's going to happen. Father, we thank you for the coming rapture. That those who have gone before, as well as those who are alive, will be raised to meet you in the air. What a glorious reunion. We thank you for the marriage that's coming. We thank you even for the judgment seat of Christ. And Father, though we don't understand all of the tribulation, we pray that you would help us to act, to beware, and look around us as to who you would want us to speak to, to share the gospel. Help us in our study. Lord, help us to honor you with our lives day by day. For we'll give you all the praise. And Father, before we close, we pray if there's any here who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. They don't understand. All of this stuff is above them. It's just very confusing. But we have a God who sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross. And he died to pay for everyone's sin. We pray, Father, that any here who's never trusted Christ may call for help today and accept Jesus Christ as the one who bore their punishment. They're forgiven, and they can begin to live an incredible life, and they can join us all as we celebrate together in heaven. Dismiss us with your blessing. Continue to put your hand of blessing upon this fellowship and those who lead here. In Jesus' name, amen.